Hello, I wanted to do a tutorial on uh, balancing a template, uh, mixing um, a hybrid cue. And um, this is a, a lyrical uh, kind of a sci-fi fantasy piece I did. And um, um, so uh, let's listen to it and then I'll talk about uh, balancing and my philosophy and, uh, and whatnot. Hold on. Okay, so um, as you can hear, it's a, kind of a modern sounding uh, thing um, um, due to some uh, post-processing on, uh, on the master bus, which I'll get into because uh, sometimes you do it and sometimes you don't. Mostly you don't, but um, sometimes you just need that little extra, you know, push. So, um, so the first thing is um, my philosophy on, uh, or on balances. Hold on a second. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, I'm one who believes in, in a balanced template. Um, I kind of treat the orchestra as one instrument, um, kind of one instrument that does many, many things. Um, and um, I feel that um, if, you know, uh, if I get away from that thinking, then everything uh, turns to garbage really, really fast for me. So um, it's just, you know, I played with orchestras for a long time and I just, you know, that's how I hear an orchestra. It's one unit with many, many facets that has its own inherent balances and EQs. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've gone back and forth about that philosophy and, and I just realized that, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, orchestras have been coming up now for, I think, you know, uh, 500 years, maybe longer. Um, yeah, definitely longer, and um, you know, kind of finally got perfected uh, about the time of uh, you know uh, Wagner and um, you know Berlioz just before him, and um, you know it's um, you know Beethoven made a lot of advances in making the orchestra you know more modern. And it's just something that, you know, over the centuries uh, has settled into a particular, uh, uh, you know, technology. And, um, you know, it's it's like, uh, to me, um, my philosophy is it's like, why uh, mess with something that's already working? Um, and, um, you know, a lot of people do mess with it. And some people very successful, you know, Hans could care less about the inherent balances of the orchestra. Um, and he's very successful. Um, you know, probably the most successful composer uh, right now. Um, but I can't think like that. Um, it's not that I, you know, can't, I won't. Um, and it's not even that I won't. <laughs> it's just that it's unnatural for me. And, th um, you know, so I think of the orchestra as one unit. It's got its own inherent balances and its own inherent uh, EQ. So how do you get that into your uh, your, your mock-up? Well, um, First of all, we're really lucky right now 
Um, you know, we weren't so lucky in the past. We had uh, VSL and East West Clown Loop Symphonic Orchestra. Both orchestras have severely um, messed up their balances uh, within the patch itself. And so you get um, an unnatural uh, dynamic range for each instrument that has to be compensated for. Um, you know, I was going to get into how to compensate for it. Um, and um, I'm just not going to. Um, it, it's, it's a pain in the ass. And uh, it's really, really hard. Um, I've done it. Um, I'll briefly show you. Um, Woodwinds, uh, I, I host in Vienna Ensemble, which is over here on the right. Um, I know it's kind of small because I have two screens and I'm trying to crunch it down into one. And so um, you've got, uh, I've got these set low. And then within each uh, instance, if you notice, I've got balances set on the, on the faders for each uh, patch. Um, and then even that's not enough. You have to use CC1 and CC11 to balance out the uh, dynamic range. Because if you look um, here, I'll, I'll bring up a VSL, uh, which is in contact. Yes, I still use the contact one just because I love contact. Um, if you notice the staccatos, that's too loud. Um, the thumping is, is, by the way, me uh, banging on the keyboard. It's not the instrument. That's too loud. So... You have to take the CC11 and bring it down to range. Like the flute shouldn't really be much louder than, you know, here I'm gonna uh, mute my voice so you don't hear the thumping. That's as loud as the flute should go. And then this one, if I had it all the way up, You know, and no matter what I did, you know, I could take the levels down um, here, there, it was just off. And so I have to balance it also in real time using uh, a fader. And so um, to do that, uh, to learn how to balance, I actually took a piece uh, by Debussy and I took the score and I uh, played it through my DAW and I looked at the meters to find out, you know, about what instrument you know, would, was playing where, depending on the dynamic and uh, also combinations of instruments up to a full orchestra tutti, which was, uh, I, I recommend doing uh, with every cue that you like, um, every piece that you like, um, just do it and just kind of look at the score and think, you know, if there is no score, if it's like a, a film score or whatever, um, just listen to it and say, okay, the, the orchestra is playing, you know, a tutti mezzo forte, um, where is that on the meter? Um, or the synth is coming in, um, and I like the sound of it. Uh, where is it on, you know, the meter? And I would just check the, the volume meters, the peak meters, find out where it came in, you know, where it peaked and where it left. And I sort of get, got a mental note of uh, things that I liked. And, you know, um, and you'd be surprised. Um, you know, I did that with uh, time, um, also with Hans Zimmer's uh, time. Um, inception piece and um, I was actually surprised that for as huge as it sounds um, it, it actually uh, you know uh, isn't that loud at the beginning and then um, he uh, limits the upper dynamic range uh, by through some sort of compression I don't know it could have been the you know the CD track or whatever um, and, um, and so it kind of, it flattens out the top, which I didn't really like, cause then it creates this sort of pinched buzzy sound, which, uh, I don't really like, but you know, it, it, it kind of worked in that piece for some, it made it kind of modern and hip. Um, but, um, he gets to that top really, really fast. And so that was important to know because, um, if you're ever doing a cue like that, that's kind of a modern hybrid cue. Um, you know, they're more loud than soft. And um, he got, by the time the orchestra was in its mezzo forte range, he's, it was pretty much at the top of the dynamic range. And then everything uh, fortissimo, as it got even more and more full, uh, was limited by a limiter. And um, just it kind of uh, created this unusual sort of it sounded louder, but it wasn't actually reading any louder on the meter. And so, um, you know, you know, I, it was almost like a tension kind of sound at the end, you know. It was, was kind of cool. I can't say that I didn't like it. I liked the piece a lot, actually, you know. So, um, 
All right. So on this particular piece, the first thing um, that's a little bit on balancing, um, put things up in your DAW, see where things read on the meter. Um, you know, I picked Debussy because he has a lot of solo instruments and a lot of different various combinations. If, if you pick only film tracks, then you'll be really limiting your education, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, you can do that with John Williams, you know, put his stuff up and see, you know, OK, where. You know, when the trumpets are playing, you know, bah, 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 you know, where is that coming up? Um, you know, when it's dum, dum, you know, just the partial orchestra, uh, where is that coming up? Um, you know, do it with Harry Potter, you know, where is that, uh, you know, the, it sounds kind of up in front, the uh, cellist. Um, where is that peaking? You know, in relationship to the strings that come in, you know, the fast strings stuff underneath it. Where is that coming in? Uh, how, where are they together? And you just take a look at the meters right over here. And, and you just say, oh, okay, um, that's where it's at. It's like minus 24 dB. Or, you know, it's about halfway. And so um, you get like a real good idea that uh, things aren't what they seem. Um you know, the optical or the uh, auditory illusion of loudness may not at times be that loud. And then uh, things that are really bassy, uh, you know, may be really pushed. Um, the low end may be pushed really hard. And so you get, you know, meters peaking almost, almost at full, even though it doesn't sound that loud because, you know, the bass frequencies need to be pushed really loud in order to be heard. So, um, and that's another thing to watch for too. Are you pushing your bass frequencies too loud and actually destroying the loudness of your mix because your bass is too loud and it's taking up a lot of dB space that, you know, and you're pushing and pushing and pushing, especially those of us at home studios, you know, you're pushing and pushing and pushing that you get more bass, more bass, more bass, more bass. And then, uh, you've just completely destroyed anything, uh, on top of that because there's no more room left for it. Um, and that is a, a big, 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 big mistake that I've made and a lot of people continually make. Um, they push the bass too loud. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, on this cue here, um, the first thing is, is uh, on mixing. Um, that was on balance, and now it's on mixing. Okay, so I have four different elements. I have the orchestral, I can consider one instrument in of itself synths um of various uh you know rhythm and uh, pads uh, so i consider that a sub a, another uh instrument and then you know you can do rhythms with synths you can do uh pads you can do soundscapes whatever um sound design um which is kind of a blending of what i considered synth and and uh, sounds uh you know recorded sounds and um per, uh drums drums and there's orchestral drums and then there's you know hybrid or sound design drums or rock drums or whatever it is you know there's all sorts of things and um if you look over here i kind of have things sort of set set up like that i have a uh, low brass uh all woodwinds all brass um all orchestral percussion all strings keys and harps um these are buses that i bus my tracks to rhythm section uh, music submaster, what I call that's where I put um, wherever I want um, uh, m m my orchestra comes up. I should actually probably call it that orchestral submaster. It's, it's my own bias, I put music submaster, <laughs> but I, I it's a pro it's an orchestral submaster. I put everything that has to do with an orchestra through the same bus, um, but I pre bust everything too. So I have one you know bus for strings, and then I st I bust that over to uh, my music. Um, us and um yeah i can you know i can call the orchestral bus the music bus and then i, I i'll call the uh the uh, other stuff the noise bus <laughs> that's how i kind of figure it in my mind but anyways um this uh i was told not to do but um i love doing this and that is i put everything in my orchestra in one hall and i do that across the orchestral bus and i just put a uh, I mix a little bit of the reverb in there. Um, and then I put an EQ that changes depending on the cue, but this one was a hybrid cue with a lot of other synth bass stuff in it, so I, I kind of rolled the bass off just a tiny bit, not much. Never do much 
to something where you have a lot of instruments going through. And I'm going to repeat that many, many times. Do not do a lot of stuff to a bus or the master bus, uh, the stereo bus, where you have all your instruments going through because you will destroy any, any credibility that you have, um, any integrity uh, if you do too much because it affects everything. So um, anything that you can do on these, you know, major buses um, is probably best handled at the track level or, you know, in one of the sub buses, what I call like, you know, you want to get a little bit more sweetness out of the strings. And so you put an EQ on there or you boost, a, you know, a little bit or you enhance it with the stereo stuff. You know, all the stuff that you do is best handled away from the main buses. Um, and then when it comes to like the main buses, um, I'll talk a little bit about that too, but for now, um, all right, so let's talk about the mixing. Um, the first thing is I had these two cues that I, I sound designed in uh, Omnisphere. It's a uh, guitar uh, effects, and then I heavily synth them up. Um, and, um, and so I, the first thing in the mix is you want to create a space. It's like you, sh you got the space and you want to put your instruments in a space. And this space I wanted it to be larger than life. And, and it was very expansive. And so I had to really, really think about like how I was going to get everything um, situated on a virtual stage. Um, so that was the first step. <laughs> So I wanted my synths way, way, way in the rafters um, on the sides, and I wanted my orchestra in the middle. Um, but it also the orchestra's got to sound big, so it needs to be spread out in its own space. So I had to put the synths way, way, way. And what I did is I put all the low sort of you know sound design -y synths on uh, in one um, I call it low synth pads, one bus, um, and then. I enhanced it. I spread it way, way, way out. And then uh, EQ'd it to get some distance on it. And then put a little reverb on there just to, you know, glue it all together. And so you get this feeling that it's around you. So um, the reason why I didn't want to get into how to balance an old-fashioned uh, uh, music library or a sample library is that I switched almost everything I do to some more modern libraries. Um, Hollywood uh, strings and Hollywood brass make up my strings, as well as uh, cinematic strings and lass. And um, they were these guys. Um, there was a little messing around uh, in in uh, CS strings with a very very upper register. And there's a little bit of uh, of enhancement in the short strings uh, for Hollywood strings, I noticed. But mostly these guys kept the dynamic ranges of the instruments intact. So that becomes my uh, balance template. Um, the dynamic ranges are intact. And I don't have to sit there and fiddle around with finding the right dynamic range for a patch because the patches were left uh, pretty much unaltered. Now, that being said, you know, there is some little bit of monkeying around and, you know, you'll hear some short string stuff that's just way too loud, in my opinion. But um, but mostly, uh, you know, the a lot of the modern libraries um, will keep the stuff intact. Some of them don't. Um, unfortunately, I, you know, I still hear libraries where they'll boost the clarinets and like, you know, to take up the entire dynamic range. And you're just like, oh. You know, but I mean, it's like I, I hear where they're coming from. You know, you can't really sell a, you know, a woodwind library or, um, you know, where y y the dynamic range of the woodwind is left intact. And, you know, it only peaks at, you know, minus, you know, 16 dB. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> people would freak out at that because they just don't know that woodwinds are just not that loud. And um, and so, you know, they fill up the dynamic range and, and um, you know, that little trick I showed you, just lower it a bit, 
um, on your on your meter. Uh, find the right balance, uh, and then use CC11 if you can if you can hook it up to kind of ride it manually. Uh, you know, uh, so that it doesn't get too out of hand, um, dynamic wise. And um, you can go into you know, and I had done this in the past. Go into and you can actually rebalance uh, at the sample level, but it takes a lot of time and it's a really pain in the butt. And and there's a lot of uh, libraries coming out now that um, you know that really try to keep the original dynamic range intact. And you know, I'd like to move to doing my own library someday you know, if I get enough money to just hire people and just do one where everything is just left untouched because the more processing these guys do with their commercial libraries, the the worse it is at the end. And, um, you know, it's, it's actually getting to a point now where, um, you know, mock-ups um, are almost going, uh, you know, backwards, um, you know, uh, there's some libraries out there that are so messed with that um, that even sonic implant strings, you know, that came out, like, I think, in the late 90s would do a better job than some, you know, newer products coming out. And um, just because they didn't mess with it, the final recording that much. Um, and same with uh, sonic implants uh, woodwinds, which I really like the sound of. They just lack legato, but it sounds more natural, you know. It's not, like, blaring. And... Um, you know, and that's something I really wish that um, kind, of, kind of the money of the would go away from sampling, you know, and uh, people would just, uh, you know, do not try to hype everything. That's my sample plug. Uh, don't try to make it better than it is. <laughs> it's already great, you know. Um, OK, so that's the first thing in mixing is finding a virtual stage. And so uh, the synth pads I wanted really far far out and the orchestra um if you notice uh the the woodwinds are slightly more resonant than the strings in this dynamic if you're coming up here strings and woodwinds Okay, so um, the woodwinds, um, I, something I noticed uh, in recordings is they don't, can't play as soft as strings and they can't play as loud as strings. Um, and, you know, I, you know, um, I just generally, generally tend to, to notice that it has a more limited dynamic range than strings. So um, if you notice the first entrance of the woodwinds here, it's... <laughs> not as soft or as loud as what's coming up. All right, so that's another thing to take care of in, in balancing. Uh, it's not even a mixed thing. That's why I always say that, you know, once you balance, then the mixing sort of takes care of itself in a lot of ways. All right, so the piano, which I never finished, uh, I couldn't finish working on. It still bothers me a little bit, but um, how do we get that thing um, back? It's a closed mic sample, which is uh, something that you, got, you guys uh, will, will come across a lot, actually. Um, something that we come across a lot is you have a sample that you like. I love, I love this piano. Um, it's a little out of tune. It was, I think, it recorded at 142 or something, and then I have to like lower it. But um, it's something that if I take off all the processing, if you notice that here, see that it's. If I take off all the processing on this thing, you will notice that it is really close and really dry. Right, and so again, the thumping is just that I have my microphone stand on the on the uh, on the desk. 
All right. So um, the first thing I wanted to do is just set it back a little bit uh, using an air absorption technique um, with EQ. And you just roll off a little bit um, of the highs, just a tiny bit, not even more than, you know, 2 dB. Um, starting somewhere in the middle, uh, and you just start rolling it back a little bit. So it, it sets it back a little bit. Okay, that's with, and this is without. See, moves it back just a tiny bit. <clears throat> so it starts to sound like it's in a room, okay? So then next, um, just to give it a little shimmer, um, I set up a, a chorus here and a little bit of an EQ, I mean a reverb chorus. So you see, it helps with the room. Um, without, with. Gets it a little more room sound, you see that? Okay, and so then, um, once I had like a room, and I could have gone farther than, uh, than what I'm doing, uh, guys. Um, I just, uh, it was a cue I had to do in six hours, and I've gone back since and, and done some uh, stuff, but... Um, yeah, I could have done a, a slight early reflection. Uh, I like using this room works. I don't know why. Um, done it so that um, just by ear, giving it just a little bit more room sound. See? See, that um, gives it a little bit early refraction. It makes it sound like it's in a room. Okay, I used to have this thing called SPAT that would help, but I went 64-bit, and unfortunately SPAT's not 64-bit. And SPAT is a room em emulation, um, which uh, works really well at doing what I'm doing here manually with about five different plugins. Um, then, um, I could have brought out the room a little more, um, with a, an additional EQ, um, boosting the room sound, maybe down below here. Uh, let's see if that makes any difference. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, that doesn't, it's really not doing much. Yeah, so um, that's it. Okay, so then finally, uh, I had to get it in my hall. And I usually put my keys out of my rhythm tracks, but this time um, I, I wanted classical piano on this one, so I just put it out of my main uh, music submaster, I call it, the main orchestral bus to give it uh, sound like it's in a hall. <laughs> Okay, and here's another one where the dynamic range seems like it's a little bit altered um, from the original, but uh, I just learned to live with it. Yeah, so like, you know, a piano is, uh, you know, a piano by itself, uh, I don't think would ever be uh, that loud. <laughs> so I just uh, used the softer ones, and it had a nice sound to it, so... Um, So, you know, you can hear I got it in the orchestra. Like I said, I could have gone a little further, but it was doing what I wanted it to do. All right, so that's how you take um, very, very manually by hand, take a close mic sample and make it seem like it's fitting within uh, ensembles that were recorded in larger rooms or even in halls. And um, that's a uh, that's a long way to do it, um, you know. Room positioning um, software um, is um, actually something that actually would work, um, probably even a lot better than um, than what I'm doing. But um, that is something I do, even if I record uh, 
something uh, at home, um, you know, in my home studio. And I use it, I close, uh, some uh, procedure that I, I just got used to doing uh, for stuff that was uh, recording my clarinet closed mic'd. And I needed to set it, uh, you know, at least within the ballpark of uh, any, uh, you know, orchestra or big band ensemble that I was recording over. And um, so, you know, the air absorption technique thing, uh, there's, if you look online, there's uh, plenty of places online that, uh, actually I only found one place where they have a calculator that you can calculate, you know, how far, if you want it to be, you know, in meters, I think, um, how far you want your instrument set back and what the density and the altitude will do to the, the higher frequencies. And uh, from all those, you know, complex cal calculations uh, using the calculator, thank God they had a calculator, um, I just sort of came to the conclusion that you just start rolling it um, somewhere around here. <laughs> and by the time you're back here, you know, you, you've rolled it back like about 3 dB. Um, even 3 dB is probably too much, but, you know, I can't really hear yet um, anything less than... Uh, than about two dB, um, like if if somebody boosts something one dB and I can barely hear it, and so um, I'm sure that I will get to the point where I can hear it. But um, so you know, to me it sounded like you know the piano. Once I yeah, and that's another thing too. If you don't use this uh, rollback technique, I found that then the the processing that you do have on it. It sounds like, you know, there's a close instrument and then there's stuff in the background. So you got to kind of, you know, set. You know, set it. You know, sort of. You know, kind of like, um you got to set the instrument in the room, like in the distance first, like, you know, think about air absorption first, and then you can start adding your, you know, uh, effects. All right. So that is, uh, how to set a close mic sample back into space. Um, and that's another, you know, issue of, uh, of balancing. It's not even, you know, that much of a mixing. It's just making sense of like, okay, I don't want this instrument in my face and how do I take it back? away from my face and so that's the thing um a lot of times especially uh new people um seem to uh neglect um is the idea that you're putting your stuff in a space now be very very careful uh especially new guys and i've you know i've corrected about uh you know three or four people and i've made this mistake over and over again and i promised myself if i ever make a mistake you know i'm i'm like pretty you know uh classically trained and uh, this stuff is kind of new to me um, even though I've been working at it for a few years now, but, um, I promised myself that if I, uh, figured something out, um, that I would share it. Cause I, I really don't think, uh, you know, I, I, I hate to say that I hate the technology. It's just, for me, it's more of a necessity, um, than, uh, a passion. If I could do music without using technology, I would in a heartbeat. Um, I don't love it. And I'll be the first to admit that I don't love it. I don't love samples, you know. <clears throat> I, I, I like synths a lot, actually, because you're creating something with them. But s samples to me is just like you're just, you know, you're you're faking that you have the real thing. <laughs> and if it wasn't something that I had to do, I wouldn't do it. Um, but that being the case, since I have to do it, then I want to do it as good as I can. And so um, what... Um, uh, I'm leading to is that um, I always promise myself that if I figured anything out that I would share it because I don't think people should be struggling with the technology and you know struggle with your music and you know and it's something technology gets in the way of the music I've written plenty of so many bad pieces just because I was struggling with the technology and didn't have time to think about the music um, but um, you know once I got a hold of the technology then all of a sudden you know my musical ideas started to come out better and I'd say I'm about 75% there. And, and about another, t you know, couple weeks, I'll probably be the rest of the way there. I'm starting to get to the point now where I, if I hear that an orchestra can do it, I can pull it off with samples. 
And I'm actually very happy to get to that point because I can start start thinking about music again. And I don't have to think about crappy samples all the time. And um, so um, the point is, is that I don't think people should struggle with the technology. I think, you know, we should just get it down and then we struggle with the music because that's what makes, you know, everything more exciting, you know. I'm not one of those people that say, well, if I give, you know, somebody a technical advantage, then they might, you know, be competition. So what, you know, compete with the music. Don't compete with, you know, your knowledge of, you know, how to use a compressor. It's like compete with your ideas, you know, your heart and your soul and your mind. Not with, you know, it is does he know all the shortcuts to his DAW? Um, that kind of stuff to me is just so petty. It's un freaking believable. And so, um, like I just felt like, you know, if, if I learned anything, I would pass it along. And so that's what I'm doing here. Um, so the get back to the original point is don't make the mistake of trying to fix a library that already sounds good already. Okay. <laughs> and this is something I run into a lot. And um, one guy uh, about a year ago posted this piece on VI control and I could tell everybody panned it. Everybody thought it was horrible, you know, and I could tell um, that the piece was good. I could tell that the composer knew what he was doing. Uh, he was new, but I could tell that he knew what he was doing and the piece was good. The, he was having a horrendous time with his libraries and I could tell that right away. And um, so I, you know, I took the time, um, you know, I'm not much of a poster anymore. I was, but I took the time with this guy to be like, you know, well, what are you doing? What libraries are you using? Blah, 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 blah. And I got the whole information from him. And um, I realized that he was trying to fix and pan in EQ libraries that were already recorded in place in a room um, and a good room. You know, he was using Albion, um, you know, best recording studio in the world, uh, in my opinion. And um, he was trying to fix and pan and do all compress and do all this weird stuff to libraries that were made to sound good already, you know. And I so I told him, I said, just take all that crap off. I mean, literally just take every single plug in that you plugged in um, and take it off because you're just messing up your library it was already recorded in place uh it was already recorded in a great room and it was already recorded well so you don't need to eq you don't need to slap on a whole bunch of reverb and you don't need to do anything to make the library sound good um or you know because uh, all you're going to do you doing is altering uh drastically uh something that was already good to begin with and uh and he did that and his piece uh you know it, it really kind of lit up he had other problems to um you know he was a beginning composer um but um you know it was it was night and day and so i still run into that every once in a while and i and i don't mention anything just because i'm so you know i'm tired of uh, arguing with people on a forum but um you know i still run into that where people will do uh all drastic things to to do something to a library that's already you know pretty well you know recorded by people that already knew what they were doing all right, so um, speaking of uh, doing drastic things, I will now move to the master bus. Uh, okay, if you notice over here, I don't know if you can see it that well on the split screen, but I have some compression and some uh, limiting on the master bus. And uh, my, my master limiter actually comes with a set of, a suite of things. It's got EQ, loudest maximizer, uh, multiband dynamic, uh, and multiband stereo, stereo imaging. All right, so I needed it uh, as a hybrid queue. I needed it to, to be a little more hip than it was sounding without the stuff. And so if you notice, if I take the stuff off, um, it still sounds good. It's still a good mix, you know. Um. Okay, so if you notice, it's still a pretty good mix and things are still pretty balanced. And that's another thing is, is that if it's not balanced by the time you slap something on the master bus, 
then the master bus is only going to make it worse. Um, and, and, and a lot of things, you know, I just needed that hipper sound. Um, but in on, in all honesty, I probably should have put a little bit of uh, a reflection on, on my woodwinds cause they do sound like they're a little in your face, but, um, in all honesty, um, you can't fix something by messing with the master bus. And then anything you put on the master bus is going to change your mix, mix dramatically. And sometimes for the worse, a matter of fact, it's almost a hundred percent. It's going to be for the worse, but, um, you know, you need to do it sometimes just because you need that modern sound. So the first thing is, is I put a little compression, just a tiny amount. It's on the softest setting here. I use uh, something Stillwell's The Rocket just because I love this thing. It's so versatile. It can be, you know, in your face loud and it can also be very subtle, which is great. And if you notice, it just makes it a little more forward, right? But if you notice also, it messed up the woodwinds. Uh, the woodwinds that I'd carefully balanced out um, when there was no, you know, stuff on the master bus are in place. And you notice the wood, the string starts softer and then they overtake the woodwinds and then, you know, they come down below the woodwinds because the strings have a greater dynamic range, right? Well, you know, I put this bus compressor on and it just messed it up. Uh, even though it's not compressing anything. And that was something that was a shock to me. The compressor hasn't even activated and it still messed up, the, you know, the delicate balance. And I just, I, I just live with it. You know, I remixed it a little bit, but I just live with it. I was like, you know, I just needed, uh, the punch, um, later on in here. See that? So it gave it a more fullness, a little louder and more punch. And I needed that. Um, also you'll notice that, um, that the dynamic range goes greater than what I had. So without the, the gain reduction, it just, you know, it was just getting too loud and I would have, you know, needed to bring everything down and, and uh, which, you know, is a possibility, but I needed some volume. So, um, so then um, I put in a tiny bit of ozone, which is a mastering suite. Um, and you notice I did this uh, to get it a little more volume and a little bit more peak control, but just a tiny amount. See that? that door, the limiting did is actually believe it or not restored um um the highest uh level by putting a little bit of limiting on on the peaks um i was able to kind of uh, bring up the mix and uh bring it back to even though the dynamic range is reduced um the apparent loudness it got a little louder and which is what i wanted because it got actually a little softer when i put the rocket on there fuller maybe a tiny bit louder but the uh the brass just you know i, I almost lost them <laughs> on on the with the compression uh if you notice and so i just kind of i just didn't like it um but i needed the compressor to kind of fill you know kind of glue it together and that's another thing is like you know hybrid stuff many different elements and you sometimes you just need to glue them together and so I put the limiter on and uh, gave me back my loudness and punch.
So there you have it. Um, there's a lot of stuff to go into. Um, it's almost impossible to do a full on tutorial. That's why people do, you know, courses and courses for weeks on end on this stuff. Um, but uh, the main thing is, is your uh, relative balances, um, balances of instruments, um, making sure that, you know, your flutes uh, don't overpower your trumpets. Um, checking them, I, I check them on a meter a lot, actually, just because I know where they're supposed to lie. Um, um, and also it destroys distance um, if something is too loud relative to something else. Um, and then um, the next thing is uh, space, your space, which, you know, um, some of that is balance. The other that is, uh, you know, putting things where they belong. Um, close mic samples, bringing them back into the orchestra. Uh, ambient stuff, making sure that it's, you know, out of the way and ambient. Um, seems like it's coming from all around you rather than directly at you. Um, um, and that's uh, those are the things that you consider. Uh, you know, not everything can share the same uh, space. You know, that's why a lot of guys, uh, they, they mix in 5.1 because they want that space. Um, you know, I still mix in two stereo, but um, you still want to give that illusion of space that there's, you're, you're in a, some space and it's, you know, um, you know, it's pretty massive uh, in terms of the, the orchestra. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, the orchestra itself, I kind of like to leave it untouched. Uh, a lot of it is untouched. A tiny bits of EQ and compression here and there, but mostly I just like the sound of the orchestra. So I, I choose libraries that are already well recorded, and, you know, I, I hate close mic samples. Oh, God. Whoever thought of that idea for orchestral stuff is... <laughs> to me should should be you know put in prison for ruining my life because <laughs> i hate close mic samples um you know it's just so unnatural like you know if you go to an orchestra concert you're in the hall you're, you're sitting you know away from the orchestra if you play in an orchestra you know a lot of the instruments are sometimes you know nine meters uh away from you or more you know and you know, if you conduct an orchestra, you know, there's space and, you know, there's always space in an orchestra. You don't shove a mic up the bell and then expect that you're going to magically come up with an orchestral sound. It's, you know, it's just not going to happen. And I don't care how many people, you know, you know, rely on close mic samples and any combination of, you know, the latest reverb technology and room spatial software and all that stuff. It still sounds like, you know, artificial crap to me. So um, I like to, you know, get uh, samples that are already recorded with, with the orchestral composer in mind. Um, get one. Uh, Hollywood series is great. Uh, I didn't pick up the woodwinds, uh, uh, but, um, you know, strings and brass and the, and, and the percussion are probably going to be pretty good. Um, uh, cinematic strings. Uh, he did a really good job. Uh, he did boost a little bit of the short strings and on the, the and, but it's only 3 dB in the upper dynamic range. Um, it could be controlled a lot with CC11. Uh, LAS, uh, I use LAS LS is another one, you know, pretty well intact, um, a little louder than I think strings should go, but um, easily controllable. Um, and so libraries that um, are recorded, um, you know, I, don't, I haven't picked up any of the Albion and I'm looking into Sable. Um, but string, you know, things that are recorded with the original dynamic range intact are very important um, to doing uh, a mock-up um, that it at least, is, you know, comes close to what you think an orchestra should sound like. All right. If you hung out this far, thank you. Take care.